In this video, I'll be showing you what a data frame is, why you should use it, as well as efficient and intuitive methods for indexing into it. As a motivational example, let's look at the first four lines of the R script. You'll see that I have four vectors here, two of which contain character data, two of which contain numeric data. If I wanted to summarize the content of these four vectors simultaneously, a first choice would be to write a for loop. However, this solution doesn't generalize, especially considering that I may want to extract specific information, or I may want to do some computation based on individual elements. Basically, we would have to rewrite our for loop for every summary activity. To address this problem, at least in part, R has introduced the concept of a data frame, which is a way to integrate or to take different data types and merge them into a single data construct. Creating a data frame is quite easy. We simply call the data frame function. In this case, I'm creating a data frame called my underbar df, which merges, in effect, the contents of the four vectors. Once we create the data frame, it's easy to look at its contents. We simply type the name of the variable. Now this looks very much like a matrix structure. However, remember that matrices in R require you to commit to a single data type, just as vectors do. The distinguishing characteristic here is that we have a variety of data types all within the same construct. As an example, we'll take a look at the class of the columns, and we'll see that two of them are factor, and two are numeric. So we have a matrix structure that also behaves like a list. If you recall lists, they also will accommodate heterogeneous data types. Because a data frame behaves in part like a list, we can index into it. We can address specific columns by using the dollar operator. So in this case, I will pull out the temp column using the dollar symbol. Once we have our data frame, there may be a number of things that we want to do to it, such as add new columns and rows. R makes this very convenient. As an example, we'll add a new vector to our data frame. In this case, I'm creating a vector called smoker, which corresponds to whether or not the individual smokes. To bind this to our existing data frame, we simply call the cbind function which stands for column bind. It's easy to predict what the result will be. If we type the data frame, we see that we have a new column. In this next example, I'm creating two data frames, df1 and df2. We see that df1 has IDs P1 through P3. df2 has IDs P4 through P6. If we wanted to combine this into an integrated structure, we simply call rbind and the result is a single data frame. This next example is a little bit more complicated. Let's say that we have two data frames, TB1 and TB2. In both data frames, we have a column called indiv ID, which corresponds to an identifier. In table one, or data frame one, we see that we have IDs one, two, three, and four. However, in table two, we have one, three, four, and six. So, 1, 3, and 4 from table 1 exist, at least in concept, in the second data frame. If we wanted to intelligently combine these two data frames, we would actually want to merge them in a way that preserved the information. If we look at table 1, we see we have two columns, SNP1 and SNP2, whereas table 2 has two columns called covariance 1, covariance 2. So if we wish to merge these data frames, we would like to preserve the information from both sets of information based on the individual ID. R makes this easy using the command called merge. We'll call the merge command. We'll pass to it as arguments, TB1 and TB2. We indicate which variable that we wish to merge on, in this case, the individual underbar ID. The all equal true indicates to merge that we wish to preserve as much information as we can. Okay, if we look at the results, we see that for individual ID 1, we have the information both from TB1 as well from TB2. That is, the SNP1 information and SNP2 are present in the merge, as is the information from TB2, covariance 1 and covariance 2. If we look at individual ID 2, which is in table 1, but not in table 2, we see something interesting. 
the merge brings in that individual ID. However, since there is no corresponding information from table two, we have missing values filled in for covariance one and covariance two. This makes sense given that R doesn't know what values should be there. If we look at records three and four from table one, we see that they are also preserved in the merge. ID six, which is not present in table one, but only in TB2, also shows up in the merge, except that the SNP1, SNP2 information is missing. In this next section, I'll be describing ways to query and set the meta information for a given data frame. To illustrate these ideas, I will be using an internal data set from R called MT Cars. You can get information on any internal data set from R simply by typing question mark in the name of the data set. What we see here is that we have data extracted from a 1974 Motor Trend US magazine for 32 automobiles and 10 aspects of automobile design and performance. You may wish to become familiar with this data set because we will be using it for a number of examples in this and other sessions. I'd like to show you a couple of commands that you can use to get basic information on your data frame. First up, let's look at the in row command, which will tell us how many rows or how many observations we have in this data frame. As we already know, there are 32. The in call function will give us the number of columns, in this case 11. If we wanted to see the first few lines of this data frame, we could use the head command. In this case, we see the first six. We can pass an additional argument to the head command, which will allow us to specify how many lines we want to see. In this case, three. There's also a command called tell, which will show us the last X number of lines. Here, we are seeing the last three. We also have at our disposal the names command, which allows us to determine and set the column names of our data frame. In this situation, we kind of already know what they are, but let's see what the command returns. MT cars has the following column names, and these are reasonable since they identify interesting attributes of the cars, of each row that is. If, however, we wanted to change this information, it's quite easily done. In this situation, we have 11 names, so our replacement vector should also have 11 names. I'm going to be naming the columns the numbers from 1 to 11. Now, as you can see here, we have the column names in place. However, it doesn't necessarily make sense given that what we had before was actually more intelligible. But since this is an example, I wanted to show you what it is you could accomplish. I'd now like to introduce you to ways to subset into a data frame. Frequently, it's the case that you want only a subset or a specific number of records that satisfy some criteria. As an example, in our MT Cars data frame, we have information for automobiles that have automatic transmissions as well as manual transmissions. This is interesting in that we may wish to compare the miles per gallon for automatics versus manual. So let me show you how you might approach this. As you may recall uh, from your study of vectors, you can use the bracket notation to request specific elements. In this case, we're going to request specific rows and columns. Now, if you type a comma in between the brackets, what this indicates to R is that you wish to see all rows and all columns for the data frame. This is, in effect, the same as typing the name of the data frame we get the same number of rows and columns. However, if in this case we wanted to get column one, we could specify that on the right side of the comma. So by leaving the row indication empty, we're saying please retrieve all rows. Here we're saying pull out column one. That's exactly what we get. We could also use the colon notation to pull out columns one and two. Or we could use the vector notation to pull out columns that aren't next to each other, that aren't contiguous. In this case, I'm requesting columns 1 and 5 for all rows. We can also do this with rows. I can say, give me rows 1 through 5 and columns 1 through 5. 
So it's amazingly flexible. We can get exactly the information that we want. An additional convenience provided by the bracket notation is the ability to exclude columns. We accomplish this by using the dash notation. I'll ask, I'll request to see all rows from MT cars and all columns except for columns 1, 2, and 3. Keep in mind that the colon notation is a sequential notation. That is, 2 would be included in this. So here we're going to get 8 columns instead of the 11 that we would normally find. So here we've gotten rid of the first three. So we could also use the vector notation if we wanted to exclude columns that were not contiguous. In this case, I will get all columns except for column one, column six, and column nine. And here we go. Now we can also do this on the row side of the bracket notation. So in this case, I can exclude rows 1 through rows 30. Sort of a silly example, but I'm just going to show you what it would look like. So here we only have two lines uh, since there's only 32 rows in the data frame. The next example will be a bit more interesting. We can do more than just pass column numbers or row numbers to the bracket notation. We can actually embed logical expressions. For example, let's say that we wanted to extract the cars from empty cars that have a miles per gallon of greater than or equal to 30. In this case, we can pass the logical expression to the bracket notation. Notice what I'm doing here. I'm taking empty cars dollar MPG greater than or equal to 30. I'm extracting all rows for which that is true. If we look at this expression on its own and we run it separately, you may recall that this will evaluate to a logical vector. So when we pass the vector into the brackets of the data frame, we get back only the desired elements. We can combine this expression ability along with the numeric indexing in the next example, I'm doing the same thing, getting cars with an MPG of greater than or equal to 30, but I'm extracting columns 2 to 6. Well, you've seen that before, but here's how it would look. We can get more complicated with this. Notice that in this next example, I'm going to be extracting cars with an MPG of greater than or equal to 30 and a cylinder count less than 6. So this would give us some fairly specific information. So it's only four records that satisfy this criterion here, or criteria. And uh, we get exactly what we want. 